Hi, everybody. Welcome, everybody. We're presenting on the Career Board Saskatchewan project today. Uh, some of us are here at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatchewan. <laughs> and uh, we've got with us uh, Dirk Morrison and uh, Sammy Bonner, is that how it is? And uh, in the class, we've got uh, Bill, Janelle, Jay, and Steve. And online, joining us from uh, out there somewhere, we've got, uh, we've got Brian. Hi, Brian. We've got Clay. We've got Jeremy. Hi. And we've got Mark. So thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, if we have any technical issues, we'll solve them on the fly. But we are broadcasting to YouTube right now. And I'm sure that there's lots of people joining us uh, <laughs> live from around the world. So. Thanks, everybody, uh, coming today and working so hard in the past few days putting this presentation together. Uh, we're a team of students in the Educational Technology and Design Program here at the University of Saskatchewan. Of course, this is uh, distance learning uh, at its finest, and so we normally are seeing each other online. Today, for the first time, some of us are seeing each other in the flesh. This is uh, for a course on advanced instructional design, and uh, our partner, uh, Sandy Bonner, uh, is here today to work with us as well uh, and to see what we've done uh, with all of the stuff uh, that we've gotten from her and from other partners uh, all over the place. The partners have been uh, University of Saskatchewan, the Cradle Board Project, which was started by Buffy St. Louis back in the 90s. And we also have one escape in Heritage Park that contributed a lot of uh, resources and worked with us quite a bit throughout the project. We created a web-based resource for the Cray Board Saskatchewan project, which includes First Nations content uh, for rocks, minerals, and erosion. It's a, a unit that exists in the grade four science curriculum underneath the uh, Saskatchewan Education's curriculum. And uh, what we'd like to present to you today is the process that we went through as a team in developing the resource that we call Living Earth. Okay, so that said, I'm going to pass it off to Bill and Janelle. And Janelle. Together. So the first, the first step in our e project was to basically identify the problem. And sitting down with the client, Sandy, of course, trying to identify specifically what was required of, uh, of us in designing this interactive website. Go ahead. Um, so the, the real thing that we were looking for was a resource that would be usable by students and teachers and trying to find things that could go together um, that would meet those outcomes in the science curriculum and fill a need that we see in the schools on a day-to-day -day basis where we're looking for First Nations materials or resources that could connect to what we have. Um, and then we looked at print materials, we looked at um, some one scalar resources, we talked to some people that were involved in other projects. We've identified a huge need by teachers. We actually, when we were searching for content and things like that, we began to identify that there almost was no resources in this area, particularly for elementary science. So we we wanted to create a resource that was expandable, that people in the future could make this much larger. We wanted resources that were accessible, not only by teachers, but by students, that they could, they could actually access these online. Wanted to include all the print material that she mentioned that we researched through all Western Canada as well as the U.S. And also we wanted to link to some of the other external sites that had valuable material. And because of our partnership with One Scale One, we identified we needed to uh, link with local museums and local institutions. Okay? How do you go to the next slide? Just tap it. Hey, arrow right. There we go. So, uh, so from the beginning, I think when we first met, we had some some lofty goals, and I think those kind of broke down into these sort of three areas: that idea of content, which um, Bill and Janelle just mentioned, the idea of that we need to focus on this grade four rocks, minerals, and erosion um, unit; the idea of perspective. So again, mentioned that idea of First Nations making content, and this community building. So, so bringing that in. Um, so one of the initial mandates that were given to us was to support the local issues and viewpoints. And so to do so while the representative of first nations make your perspective. Um, and doing this, one of the goals was to improve that sort of delivery 
of education and future research currently. So to fill that void that sort of um, Janelle and Phil just alluded to. Um, we want to do it in a way that honored this alternative perspective of science. And, and that seemed to be, to be crucial, right? That seemed to be a goal that we needed to accomplish was, was to present, present science in a way that wasn't currently being presented. Um, so and initially our goal was to use Mount Scalin as a launching point and the foundation that we would build on and count them as a partner. And I think um, I should say sort of the first page is sort of homage to that with, with um, you'll see the tiles and the link to the Mount Scalin reference from there. Um, so it's clear from the first meeting that we wanted to do something that offered social interaction. I know in the past we talked a lot about um, that ability of you know, creation of online communities. And it seemed clear from right from the beginning that one of the goals was to create that kind of community for grade four teachers and grade four students, and it's something really positive to think about. Uh, yeah, so along with that idea of like not only social interaction, but that space would be collaborative. Um, um, that is that our hope was that it wouldn't just be a social space, but it would be a space where users and teachers could co-construct materials. And so hopefully, hopefully, you know, if that was in the beginning of our goal, hopefully you'll see that we've, we've tried to do that. Um, Obviously, one of one of our realizations right from the outset was that our users were going to have um, very comfort levels with online resources, and so we needed to make sure that whatever we created was easily accessible. That means it needed to be easy to navigate, needed to be easy to find for the material that was being sought, and then if it was going to be collaborative and if it was going to be social interaction space, it needed to be a place that was easy for people to share what they created with others, whether that's with students or different people. Um, initially, we threw around some ideas, and, and, and from those goals, was it going to be just a collection of links? And even then, we talked about um, the idea of well, even playing like Craigslist kind of piece. Um, and it became, from the outset, sort of the goal needed to be something more than that, right? That means it had to be, if it was going to be used, it had to be visually appealing both to students and teachers. So, along with this medic from the um, Creole board, Right, was the idea that we needed to provide a visual resource. So something that accommodated that diverse classroom, whether that's second language learners, whether that's um, developing literacy, what have you, right? And so the text needed to be simple and to be paired with pertinent images, whether still or moving, um, and it needed to then lead to the appropriate understanding. One of our goals was to provide a balance of historical and contemporary, right? So that, that past to now, so this is how we under, understand rock communities now, and this is sort of where it comes from, and we pay homage to the site, to that past, and I think that was an important, important part. So, in essence, I guess our goal was to create a sort of a blended learning resource, and we decided that right from the first meeting, that could be maintained sort of beyond our involvement with the pro project. So we knew from the beginning that we were here for four months, but we wanted something that would live long term. Um, and so it needs to have that collaborative aspect to be easily managed by a third party. And so, and in the end, right, something that supported curriculum related dialogue, relationship building, and that purposeful activity between First Nations, provincial schools, specialist organizations, community, sort of across, across the planet. So our, uh, our strategy to, our tackle, strategy the to tackle the problem and try to reach our goals was to divide the work up into three different teams. And the members chose which team they wanted to be a part of uh, based on their interests and learning goals and really the team they felt they could impact the largest. Um, the client liaison team didn't have quite as much choice. That was put into place based off um, their geographic location, just because we, uh, we thought it was necessary for them to be in the Saskatchewan area for any of the face-to-face -face meetings that needed to occur. And sorry if it seems like I'm going slow, I'm just trying to beat the echo that I'm getting here. Um, the teams met together on a regular basis, uh, usually weekly, and then the whole group <laughs> All three, all three teams together, together you, uh, you, uh, met also met on a weekly basis, basis to update, to each, update other. Each, each other. And once, and we, once reached, we reached uh, the, uh, end the end or near the end of the, the process, process, the teams, the teams 
worked more integrated and there was some more inter-team collaboration going on. Um, as far as the role of the team, the interface team, their role was to research different possibilities for the layout of the interface and decide on an interface that would best meet the needs of the client. After the initial research and the conceptual design, the interface team would actually build the working interface for the site. The content team, the role of uh, that team, was to research and gather content really around the country, Western Saskatchewan and the territories, um, or sorry, Western Canada and the territories, and a little bit in the United States as well. And once these resources and materials were gathered, the content team would categorize the materials based on the level of interactivity, um, and then they would design activities for the site that fit into the interface that the interface team had designed. And lastly, the client liaison team, their role really was to act as the face of the team, of the group, so if there was any face-to-face -face meetings that needed to occur, uh, they would be the ones who would participate and then they would pass on the results from those meetings to the rest of the group. So those are the three teams and you can see the members on the screen there. So while that lays a foundation of the early work or theory behind how we organize, um, from the interface point of view, we started with, as Mark mentioned, the research of potential interfaces for the website. I'm just going to try to screen share my, my uh, other window here. Hopefully it works and comes up. It's good. Perfect. So we had a look at three major websites, uh, starting with actually the Greenfoot website. Greenfoot is a programming, uh, instructional programming website, and it became an early basis for our work because of the collaborative nature of it. So as you can see on the screen here, there are active users who help build the community by sharing ideas and projects for feedback. While the Living Earth website didn't end up looking much like the Greenfoot website, we took that community aspect that has made this one so successful and attempted to build that into Living Earth. The next website, and I apologize that it's just a static image, in uh, typical fashion, the website seems to be down today. Uh, but it was a huge influence in our overall design. So edheads.org is a resource developed for students and teachers. If you, when the website normally works, if you go under choose an activity, there's a list of activities that are organized by topic, not by grade or specific content area. So this has an assumption that the teachers know what they're looking for without having to be led step by step. Also a huge influence from this website was the Teacher Resource Center, uh, which was directly reflected within Living Earth. In this area, teachers are able to share and download uh, resources that they have created. But we ended up taking it a step further by adding a forum which we will discuss in the future. The other piece was the ease of expansion for this website because it had limited navigation and under choose an activity it was just a simple drop down menu with the activities clearly listed. The third main influencing website was BrainPop. So BrainPop is a website, once again, designed for students and teachers, uh, but it's designed exceptionally visually with uh, eye-catching graphics. But again, our big influence was its ease of expansion by using clear headers and banners that are organized uh, in different content areas 
And we took that to living earth, knowing that while we were starting with grade four science, that if we set it up properly, we could go into different uh, specific content or curricular areas. For Brain Pop, I won't navigate you through every screen, but I do have an activity page here for you to look at. And what you see, and which is what we also try to model in our own way, is that there is an activity for students to engage in immediately, but there are also resources for teachers that they can access by linking further into the website. This puts students first, but provides teachers with that more in-depth material that they need. As Living Earth develops, uh, we hope to be able to link to the teacher-created resources and support them in the same way. So the student activities are first and foremost, but there is everything they need to take it further into their, into their classroom. So with that in mind, we went ahead and started tool selection, which is what Jay is about to speak of. So from the beginning, we had a problem. Uh, we needed to find a platform to use to create uh, this Living Earth resource. Uh, it wasn't named anything at that time either. We had this large problem. We had to bring people together from all over the place to be able to build uh, this resource. And we had to find a solution that would allow for us to do it uh, cheaply, effectively, and uh, device agnostically. We don't know. At the beginning, we didn't know who had what for operating systems or computers or devices. So we needed a solution that would allow for everybody to uh, work together in an effective way. And we decided to go with uh, Google Tools and uh, applications to be able to create the Living Earth resource. We used Google Sites for the Living Earth uh, web-based content platform. Google Sites allowed for the interface team to work together in creating uh, pages and content. We went through many revisions uh, of the site as we, uh, as we grew it and uh, discussed it and got feedback from different people. And uh, it became what it is today through uh, some trial and error, a lot of research, and uh, a lot of work uh, from all the people uh, that were working with the project. And in the end, uh, most everyone was able to com was able to contribute to uh, a variety of pages on the site. Truly, Google Sites allows for uh, a massive amount of collaboration from a number of individuals, and you can have uh, multiple people creating and and working uh, on the site at the same time. So it it worked very well for us. It wasn't without its challenges, however. We had to find ways of adapting. Uh, our ideas from the research on the main three uh, resources that Brian discussed. We had to find ways of, of making uh, what we were doing uh, work within the context of, of a Google site. At times that took, uh, it took a lot of work uh, from uh, various individuals to script and program and, and work through some problems, especially in the uh, area of content submission and the ability to create uh, forms for people to be able to uh, subscribe uh, to the site, become members of the site to contribute to our members only area. Google Documents was used extensively uh, through planning phases and collection of uh, materials. Uh, we used Google Documents uh, rather than uh, Microsoft Word or uh, Apple's pages because of the uh, collaborative nature of the documents. You can all be editing a document at the same time, just as we were with the website, and uh, it, it proved to be a fun way to, for us to, to work together as well. Google presentations. We're using a Google presentation right now to present the content that we uh, worked through. Um, and Google presentations was also used to build interactive tools within the website. There are some embedded Google presentations within the Living Earth resource which have become interactive uh, tools or activities for students to use. Google Forms. Our membership application is driven by Google Forms, which populates a spreadsheet. 
and that will be discussed later on in the presentation. Essentially, if you want to become a member of the Living Earth website and the teacher resource uh, area of the site, you can apply for a membership to the moderator and you'll fill out a form. That form generates uh, content within a spreadsheet that the moderator can look at and then make decisions on whether or not you can become a member. Google Drive. Google Drive is a web-based uh, repository for all of the resources that we brought together. It worked for us uh, in bringing all of the different resources from many different sources uh, together into one place so that we could view them, uh, work with them, uh, decide whether or not they were uh, something that we needed to use within the Living Earth uh, resource later on. Google Drive allows for us to organize content depending on the type of content that it is, whether it be an image or a video or a document. Uh, it allows for the, a moderator in the future to be able to organize content simply within the Living Earth uh, site's context. It also allows for us to have a lot of space for content uh, rather than using up uh, space within the Google Sites. Most of the big content is stored through Google Drive rather than through the site itself. We used uh, uh, we used embedding to be able to take that content and put it inside of the website from Google Drive. So it was a it was a way to keep our our team efficient as well. Google Groups is being used uh, to manage the users that are uh, part of the site. Anyone who just uh, applies for a membership to the site will be able to uh, be a part of Google Groups. That's where the forum and discussions happen as well. Google Hangouts. We're in a Hangout right now. We're broadcasting to YouTube Live, and it will be uh, recorded and documented for us to look at in the future. Google Hangouts allowed a way for us to work on documents together across a great distance and allowed for us to uh, have some fun. We were able to dress up in costumes at times and keep it light and friendly. And we're also able to look at many different uh, types of content and documents and work on them at the same time as we were working through uh, all of this uh, stuff. So Google uh, became a very uh, effective and cheap way for us to do the work that we did on the Living Earth. We could have chosen other platforms as well. This was uh, a contemporary solution to what we were doing. I believe that it worked out quite well for us in the end, and I think that uh, some of us will be using it in the future as well, whether it be in our classrooms or through other projects. Um, it certainly was a worthwhile endeavor for us to this point. I'll pass it on to Brian again for the different types of solutions that we found. He's going to go into more detail along with the others on what we were able to do to solve some of the problems that we had in the beginning. All right, thank you, Jay. Uh, I'm going to screen scare the web or screen share the website again here. Hopefully, it won't screen scare you. Um, so the navigation was vital to the website, and I hope you see the models that I discussed earlier reflected in our work here. We just wanted the, the main page to be easy to understand, and by that we selected a header navigation system with drop-down menus. The great thing about this navigation is that it's consistent, and so you can get, uh, to quote I think Jay from the other day, you can get everywhere from everywhere. So no matter what page you're on, you have a consistent navigation, and once you're familiar with the website, you can navigate very quickly throughout it. The other point is the science activities, as you can see, are organized by activity instead of grade, content, or specific Saskatchewan objectives. This is due to the fact that teachers know their curriculum. And so as a team, we made an assumption that a teacher who accesses website will look at the activities and be able to see the potential with their own work, within their own work, sorry, and pick out specific activities that support what they're currently doing in the classroom. Another thing, and I won't take you all the way through it because Jeremy's going to go a bit into it as well, is we add it with uh, in-page navigation as well, so users can quickly link back to the top and uh, use table of contents and other handy links to get quickly through the longer text-based pages. Jeremy, do you want to take over? Yeah, sure. So um, I'll be just talking about some of the visual elements that we tried to build into the site. Yeah. 
screen share here too, and I'll kind of talk about it as I walk you through it. So one of the things was to try and make everything consistent and predictable, uh, which Brian already mentioned, which was more to do with the navigation, so the horizontal menu. Uh, I'll just open up one of the pages here. We try to use icon navigation to help further this. There we go. So we're just taking a second to look. So you can see some of the icons that we use. One of the main ones is the question mark for our support pages. That is also continued on some of the other sections here. So you can see in the bottom there is a back to top for some of the longer pages and some of the uh, table of contents that Slowly. That will immediately bring you to a certain section of the page, again, to increase uh, the usability of the site. Top of this, we try to use as much white space and uh, the use of minimal, consistent, and contrasting colors to make it visually appealing and easy to see. Our typeface selection is limited, again, and consistent has our sizes, again, the colors within the fonts. To try and decrease the uh, need for external fonts or anything else that users may need. Our screen dimension we played around with, with quite a while. Uh, and it's designed for current common screen resolutions, including tablets, as well as uh, it were, integrates quite well on most smartphones too. So we really thought about this to ensure that that regardless of what device is being used, the user would be able to navigate easily throughout the site. We have consistent page layouts that incorporate either a single column, such as our main page, or dual columns. And the reason for this was to try and decrease the amount of scrolling needed and to have everything uh, at the forefront of the screen for the users to be able to again, navigate through what they need to find easily. The images that we have are originally high resolution and we compress those to allow the pages to load quickly. And the same is true for videos that we have. The ones that we own and have created are housed within our Google Drive and they use the same YouTube compression since they're one of the Google tools. Our student section, uh, we try to make more visually appealing and have more images, graphics, videos, so a lot more visuals and trying to decrease the amount of text that we have on the pages, especially since uh, originally this was designed for the grade four science. Our teachers tend to be a little bit more text heavy though, uh, as we thought that they could hopefully handle that. I think those are some of the main aspects of the uh, visuals that we try to incorporate into the site. So I guess we'll pass it on to Janelle who will talk about some of the main features of the site. Yeah. Just a moment while I load the activity pages here. Well, like Brian said, that we could, we connected those activities to different outcomes in the Saskatchewan curriculum. Um, that would meet the needs of the teachers so that they could use them within their classrooms, either choosing a snippet from it, like the video or the um, crossword puzzle, or the actual activity that would go, um, where they could go on a walk in the classroom or do some kind of science activity within the room. Um, but we also wanted to create something that they could pull up on their screen in their projector in their classroom and really go through the whole lesson together with their students. The other thing is, is that if each student had a laptop or had access to the internet, they could go on there and watch the video in small groups and work their way through the activities on their own. There's three um, key ways that they can use these activities and we're leaving it up to the teachers to know their students and the needs of their class in order to make them fit properly. So a couple examples that we wanted to show were, was Earth Stewards, if you can go to that one. So it starts with a little bit of an intro so that you can see the First Nations contents and how it might apply to 
a class or a teacher meeting that particular outcome. And then there's the activity along the side that is in language that would work for students and for teachers so that they can go through it together as a whole group. Um, it involves another level of that interactivity where there's a video that they can connect to. Um, that teacher could also use that video and connect it to a book or something else within the activity. And then this one has the third level of interactivity where it involves using a footprint for a carbon footprint calculator website where they would go into the activity, but then they also need to interact in another, um, in another way online as a class or in small groups or individually or even from home. Because if students can access this page like we all can through Google, then they would have access to do this on their own as well or connect it to their own learning when they leave the classroom. So it builds an even bigger community or an even bigger um, level of interactivity. And then at the bottom, we have a crossword puzzle here that they can use to take it one step further. Or what I find in the, my classroom with some EAL students is as soon as we can do the activity and watch a video and have a discussion and connect it to another part of the web, if we can put it down on paper as well, it gives it that extra piece so that students can really solidify that learning and make it work for them. And then another example I thought we'd take a look at is the Mohs Harvey scale. And that one does have a similar structure in that it has an activity, a video, it has a chart, and even some links at the bottom. But what I wanted to really focus on was that the most hardness scale, I think it was Bill that connected those to the images that he took out at Moana Skateway. So it connects to local content, and it also allows for those people that aren't able to get out to Moana Skateway and see those real artifacts, that they have visuals that they can use with their students in order to put it into their classroom. And then if you were to go through all seven of our example activities, you would see that they have a similar format that teachers, once they've seen one, they should be able to see the similarities and become familiar with using those activities in the classroom, however they see fit. And now it's on to Brian. So another piece aside from the activities that came for a client was the need for a interactive area that would allow us to build a community of learners. The forum piece came as a late addition, or the use of Google Groups came as a late addition as we wrestled with uh, many different means of achieving this. We settled on Google Groups because again it integrates well with Google Sites and the rest of the suite. But it was also a simple, easy to navigate uh, solution that all users could access fairly easy with, with limited support. As you can see, it integrates really well into a Google Sites page through a widget that they provide. And the navigation within this widget is very limited and easy to understand. So you make a new topic. Mark all is red and so on. Uh, the buttons are simple to understand and use. The actual discussions, which is why we actually moved to this away from a blog, are listed chronologically but allow for back and forth communication. So when you click on one such as general discussion, it brings up all the conversations within it with the last post being highlighted. If you want to reply, as you can see, the navigation changes in this context. It's very easy to see where to apply, uh, how to refresh, and also to go back. Did I, did I just drop off? Sorry. Okay, I'm going to keep going because I'm not sure if you can hear me. Something seems to have happened here. Um, You're here. We can hear you. Okay, I just couldn't hear anything else, so I got a little worried right there. <laughs> we have to leave our mic open, I think, for the broadcast as well. Okay. So, again, the forum integrates exceptionally easily into the site. Uh, Google Groups itself offers the moderator more uh, features than are listed here if they wish to dive into them. Uh, and it's also easy for that moderator to add anybody applying, which will be discussed again in the future here, 
to this group so it becomes a seamless uh, addition for new members. This piece, as we get more users, will become more heavily populated, of course, and we feel will be vital in creating the community important for the success of this website. And I think that leads us to Jeremy, sir. I just had to check my notes. And uh, he's going to look at the resource area. Yeah, I'm going to be discussing the uh, sharing resource area, which is another <clears throat> one of the teacher components of the site. I'm just going to screen share. So uh, as, as building part of the community, the hope was to not only have static content, but to allow teachers, educators, specialists, uh, members of the site to also contribute their own resources, their own documents they've created, their uh, lessons, whatever it might be, and to even uh, hopefully have student-generated content on here too. The way that that was going to be achieved was through this form that's on the right-hand side which allows a user, and again because this part of the site is private, to then uh, add a resource, provide a description, and talk about what grade level they feel it's for, the content area, and also choose the file uh, to embed it within this form. For this, Google Forms do not actually allow us to do this, so we went through a third-party bot form to allow us to attach these files to us. Uh, ultimately, though, that the monitor has complete control over this, as once the form is submitted, it goes into. One second. Uh, when it's submitted, it, it opens up and it shows the moderator exactly who submitted it. So all the information in the form as well as the file itself. So the moderator can uh, review the file, the resource, and decide what should or should not be done with it. The moderator then just simply has to uh, move the file to another section, uh, populate with the description. And from there, uh, the resource is automatically populated within this resource area that allows it to be searched by file name, and it immediately changes depending on what is typed in. This, uh, resource is full, further filterable by the type of file. So again, if I'm just looking for an image, documents, you can also do multiple filters. And then as well as topic. Currently, uh, we really have it limited to the topics that are available, but the hope is as the site grows and as, as more content is added, that also uh, more topics will be able to be covered in this way. The hope is that it's uh, easily expandable, which was a, a big piece of this, so we really took quite a bit of time to figure out how to properly approach this so that it is not only easy for the user, but also easy for the moderator. So uh, by having the file directly populated into the Google Drive and minimal, uh, minimal work for the moderator to be able to get it up onto the site, the hope was that it would, uh, more resources would be up and readily available for the users. And at the bottom, just like all the other pages again there, of course, is that support piece there too. So uh, ultimately, again, this is to try and build that community and try and have um, resources that have been tested and resources that teachers are already using in their classrooms that they could then discuss of uh, in the forum area. At that point, I think we'll move it on to Brian with the support page. So yes, another key feature of the website is found under the About Cradleboard SK tab. And there's two sections to that, about the project and a support page. The about page is uh, information obtained from Sandy. Again, you can see the examples of the in-page navigation as this table of contents links to specific areas of the page. Also, to support use of the end user, we've linked to specific forms or uh, feedback sections 
within here so they don't have to navigate back or, or find that in a different part of the site. So they can go simply if they notice, oh, I can upload and share a resource for others. We have a link directly to the form right here. The other piece under this that we built is the support page. Again, consistent in-page navigation and links to separate parts of the page within it. One of the key features of this page is that it is blend of text, as you can see, and video tutorials that were made using screencasting specifically for Living Earth. These resources are contained within the Google Drive site. They are not hosted by a third party or even another Google tool. And we did that so Living Earth maintains full control over them. And there's less risk of a service being down and interrupting the use of the end user. The topics came from the usability testing that we conducted and from feedback from other members of the team as they reviewed our resource. One of the central concerns was the use of Google account for those people who weren't familiar with that tool. So there are tutorials on that. And then there are quick tutorials for the other main features of the website, including accessing resources, submitting resources, and participating in the forum. Because of the structure of the navigation, this site can also, or sorry, this page can also be expanded based on common requests to the moderator in the future. I think that about covers uh, the main features at this point in time. So I know Bill is going to speak about the challenges of the website. And there are some significant <coughs> challenges when we're designing the website. The first, the first challenge that we really came across was the content team. The four of us did significant research into First Nations content. There almost none exists. Saskatchewan is a leader in First Nations content. We went to the northern United States. We were trying to keep Western Canada trying to keep with our First Nations peoples. So we looked at the northern, northwestern United States, all the western provinces, northern Canada, and federal initiatives. There's very, very little First Nations content. So we started to be, realize very quickly that the resource had to actually grow the content versus us actually finding content to put on the site. So this could not be a static site. That became abundantly clear. We also had a difficulty finding actually appropriate material for kids. There's lots out there telling teachers what to do. There's very little activities designed for teachers to use. So if, if that's what teachers need, is activities for their kids and activities to use with their classrooms, that's going to have to be generated by teachers. It, literally, we, we scoured uh, school division resources, uh, Saskatoon Public, Regina, as well as we looked at resources that were uh, uh, north of Saskatoon, northern Saskatchewan, found very, very little resources. Probably the best resources were resources from Saskatoon Public and a little bit of resources as well from, uh, I'll try to move over here and make it clear, and a little bit of resources from uh, north of Saskatoon between here and here. So we found some localized resources, but not much for kids. Very, very difficult problem. Um, connecting and collaborating with, with experts. With a short timeline we had, really a three month timeline, this is a significant problem. Uh, we did connect well with one scale one. We talked one scale one quite a bit, but many of the experts that we thought would help us really aren't content area experts. mute the microphone. <laughs> so, anyways, some of the uh, uh, experts that we talked to, while they were very knowledgeable in telling us what we should do, had very little content for grade four students. So even a lot of the resources, for example, Moe's Hardness Scale would be a very good example. We could find many, many, many Moe's Hardness Scale activities. That wasn't the concern. The concern was how to integrate in First Nations content. So our concern when we created any of the content was always how do we integrate in the First Nations content. Uh, there's many ex uh, experienced science teachers in the team as well as elementary teachers in the team. But the problem always became, how do we integrate in First Nations content that's not superficial in nature? So we wanted to dig a little deeper, make sure it was First Nations content that was meaningful to the students and meaningful to First Nations elders, for example. So we were very concerned about how we approached that. 
once we did connect with some experts, there was also the timeline concerns because, for example, one of our experts had to go on holidays or couldn't speak with us at certain times, and that caused problems with our developing the site as the site developed. So we had to initiate a lot of this on our own. Um, connecting, or sorry, establishing a common vision was also very difficult. The first month of this project, collaborating with people from all over Western Canada, not only the students, but, but experts, was very difficult. So we, we actually had a tough time trying to get a vision of what the site would be, how the site would mechanically work. And I think the content members were sort of waiting on the interface team, and the interface team was waiting on the content members. And there was a, a struggle there for a while to figure that out. Then all of a sudden, it seemed like about a month and a half, it all started to click. And we started to basically bring the teams together as one larger team, and everything started to click. It started to move along very quickly. So approximately a month ago, we sort of knew what the site was going to look like, but we had to do further development within the site. So that was actually a success in the end, but it was certainly a challenge at the beginning. Uh, creating that dynamic user-friendly resources is also very difficult. Creating online resources is a huge issue. Like uh, For us to actually create content is something that we actually couldn't take as a challenge. We had to look at our goals, and we had to basically define our goals and figure out exactly if we were going to create the interface or if we were going to create the content. And we really are uh, creating this kind of content, this rich content, is very taxing. So even for uh, members of teams that perhaps aren't in the elementary system or aren't science teachers, this is very difficult to do. So even our exemplars, that we have seven exemplars, the exemplars actually took a huge collaboration of team members to do that. Very difficult to do. So I understand the issues with elementary teachers. It's not just finding science activities, it's finding activities that we can integrate First Nations. Now there was some, we'll talk about some successes later on, but as a challenge we found we were very successful at doing that once we sort of figured out how to do it. Uh, creating a simple method for submission also became very, very difficult. The Google Drive, while it's free and accessible and all the tools that we use here today are through Google and free, one of the problems we had is that Google doesn't like it when somebody that's anonymous can actually submit files onto their drives. So the problem is you could have virus, you, they could be attacked from outside of security. So we actually considered through third parties ways to actually submit files. So we actually figured out how to go through a third party to create files on a Google Drive through the Google Groups. So that's why we have that filter where they have to actually apply to become part of the Google Group to make sure that they're actually, for example, a teacher. And some of the things that we put in place, some of the security measures, were making sure that they had for example, a school email address, or they were listed on a staff website, so we could actually check that they were actually a real staff member, and then we could let them have access to the Google Drive. The Google Drive always also goes through the moderator. This was very, very challenging. So we had to figure out a way to have a file submitted through a moderator before it could be put onto the drive. And we actually went through about four different versions of trying to figure out how to do that. And finally, we had a third-party submission where an email is sent to the moderator, alerting them that there's a new resource. The resource is held in a file folder temporarily until the moderator can go there and check it and then drop it into the appropriate file folder. Thanks. So then the next step is where do we go from here? And we talked about our recommendations, what we think um, our goal would be or what we would aim <coughs> if we could pass it off and share our wisdom. And it would be that that local content needs to replace anything that we've taken from external sites or from outside sources and really match what's happening in Saskatchewan so that it meets our curriculum and it meets our, the needs of our students. Um, the next piece is that it that needs to be uh, created by teachers as part of the community or um, by people at the university or other people that have the expertise in the First Nations and Métis um, area in order to make sure that it fits properly. The second one says the homepage banner should link to local videos. Those are some beautiful photos and banners that we've gotten from Wanuskewin. And so the goal was to have them connect to videos or things that were from Wanuskewin or things that have been created around here and that would just be something that needs to be done in the future because it wasn't able to be accomplished at this point. And then inclusion of resources developed by students. That also means when teachers are doing some of these activities with their class, if they're filming it or if they're creating presentations, 
things like that can be included as part of um, the Living Word Earth website because it will be more reflective of what's actually happening in the classrooms than something that we've created because we think it might be something that could fit. And the promotion of the site. In order to get teachers to submit their work or to use the work or to um, allow it to grow and expand in the way that we would dream it would, um, it needs to be promoted in a way that teachers feel safe to use it and are encouraged to use it within their own classroom. And the last piece is invite those First Nation and Métis elders and knowledge keepers in because they're the ones that have the knowledge that we don't have and they're the ones that can really um, transform this into something that can be a living document or something that can move forward. And then the last recommendation that's not on there but is the use of a moderator. We talked about it before and we know that that is essential in the expansion and the growth of site and Jay is going to talk about that role. Thanks Janelle. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> who will be the moderator? <laughs> Whoever the moderator becomes is they're gonna have some roles and duties to perform uh, to maintain and, and keep the site in good shape. So the moderator's roles, as we have seen them so far, uh, and what we've discussed so far as a group, the moderator uh, will need to be able to approve and manage membership for people that are applying to be a part of the teacher resource area of the website so that they can participate in the forum, download resources that have been uploaded, and also upload their own resources to the site. The moderator is going to have to approve and manage member submitted resources and move those uh, resources into the appropriate folders where the content is uh, automatically put into the website through uh, the script that uh, was created for the web page. They're also going to have to monitor the members' form through Google Groups to make sure that what's being said there, or perhaps there will be questions for the moderator, but also to make sure that everything that's being discussed within the forum is appropriate and, uh, and, and uh, things that have to do with, with the site themselves. So you don't want to have a lot of site discussions happening, you know, what, what's happening in your classroom, my classroom, but more to, to be specific to the content that's being uh, presented within the website. The moderator also then has the email addresses of all the members. So it's easy for the moderator then to communicate directly with people that are uh, adding content to the website or perhaps need to be told that the website is used for a, a different uh, purpose than what they're using it for. <laughs> so there is a there is the ability for the moderator there to to completely control everything that is uh, added to the added to the resource, uh, things that are being said on the resource, people that are involved in the resource, and the moderator also has the ability to create new activity pages and integrate content within the website. There is uh, certainly uh, through Google Sites, uh, it's it's quite easy for the moderator to then expand the resource. There doesn't have to be just one moderator either. Because we've used this platform, there can be multiple people working together on uh, the site. Perhaps if it grows to the, to the extent that we would dream that it would, uh, there's going to be the need for multiple people to work with the site and to maintain its growth and health over the years to come. Who knows what it's going to look like in the future, but this is just a beginning for what's being created here. I would like to just bring uh, to your attention as well, there is a uh, a document that was created and uh, Jeremy could you load that up for me please the moderator document <laughs> <laughs> thanks so in hangouts we have a way of looking at multiple bits of content at the same time and uh, I think Jeremy's working for me now <laughs> yeah, just, just give me a second yeah thank you very much so, I just have that loaded up. We've created a, 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 a guide for the moderator. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, this is what collaboration is all about, right? We've, we've had this opportunity to work together uh, online, and so we just ask things of each other from time to time. So, there's a moderator's guide to Living Earth that was created. This is through Google Docs. It's a living document, so that if there, were, if there needs to be more content added to the document later on, that can happen. The documents that were created, we have a group report and a moderator's guide. They're built much in the same way. There's a table of content that, contents that links you to all parts of the document. As we scroll down through the document, 
you can see that each one of the areas that we've covered, there's a philosophy for the site for the moderator to read, uh, important links for the moderator to go through, as well as how to moderate the Living Earth website. And to quote Brian, he said, it's basically like a how to moderate the Living Earth for dummies. And hopefully we don't have a dummy as a moderator, but essentially I think the, the interface is quite simple and the duties of the moderator are not all that complicated. This document serves to lead the, the moderator through each of their duties and how to perform those duties uh, in a simple way. So we have it broken down into all the different content areas that exist on the site for the moment. And if we go down to the bottom, we have some appendices on file management, the site settings, uh, as well as how to create an activity page. This may be one of the more difficult areas for the moderator to work for, through, uh, but once they've done it once, there's a, there's a way to do it. There is a format that we've been using, and that format is described uh, throughout this area here. And if we scroll down a little further, we do have a, a graphic for the site layout showing that, for the moment, we have science activities, but there could be other activity areas added to the site and that uh, future activities could be placed in, even inside of the science area. The site doesn't have to remain grade specific. It can become a multi-content uh, multi platform to deliver First Nations content across a number of curricula in the future. We would hope that it would grow in that way. The graphic also describes that there is a teacher resource area. It's in red just because it is a membership only area. And that the green areas that are described here are all public. So we do have a place for membership only uh, things to be happening with the website and hopefully that would increase the amount of traffic from professional educators within the resource. So the moderator's document serves to um, help the moderator through all of their duties uh, within the site. I'm going to slide back over to the presentation. So for the moderator's guide, there's a guide existing on uh, through Google Docs and all of the duties for the moderator described throughout it. And we'll move on to a walkthrough. Much of what we've done so far, we've walked through a lot of the parts of the website so far, and it was discussed this morning, and then a few different back and forths that what's the point of looking at the website together again? But I think we can do it. I think we can look at maybe just a quick uh, look at the website as a walkthrough from anybody that wants to participate in it at this moment. and just to maybe recap some of the areas of it. Something that we haven't gone over that much is the, the front page and the banners and the videos that accompany those. So I'm going to just bring up the website. So here we are on the Living Earth website on the front page. And I believe we've got uh, Bill, myself, Janelle, and Steve here in the room. If you guys that are out there online as well, you could contribute to this by telling us where you want to go. We can navigate it for you. Basically, it's set up with a, a home page with the navigation that was described earlier. You can get everywhere from everywhere, uh, which is very convenient once you're familiar with uh, the way that it works. Coming in, I think one of the things that we noticed from usability testing, when we first come into the website, it's maybe this is something that needs to be worked on in the future or maybe it's okay the way it is now. We have these banners, and the banners served kind of like a type of Easter egg in a way. What are these banners? Well, when people click on them, it leads us to videos of uh, First Nations content and, and it serves as an introduction to what this site is all about. Truly, it's, it's a way to deliver First Nations content throughout, uh, for the moment, science activities through the grade four minerals, rocks, and erosion, but it would serve to set up for students the idea that, yes, we are truly in a resource that describes uh, First Nations uh, uh, ideas and outlooks on all of the different content areas that we have included here. When we click on any one of these banners, uh, the site leads us to videos that are embedded within the pages. And this content could change very easily through a moderator, uh, being able to update the content to things uh, that may seem more fitting. Of course, the entire resource is fully modifiable as well. So if it were determined that the home page needed to change in some way later in the future, it most certainly could. This was just our idea on how to make it a graphical and interactive website right from the beginning.
Mm -hmm. You know, we can talk about the activities. The activities, originally we thought about depth within the site. So I think we were very concerned about how deep the site goes. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, Sandy, but the problem is we've got the, the front page here. Once you go deeper into the site, you're getting into layer upon layer upon layer. It's very, very easy for somebody navigating to get lost within the site or to go next to an external resource. So once they click to that external resource, you've lost them from your site. So we were very concerned about that. So we tried to keep the depth of the site very, very shallow. And I know this was one of your concerns that you sort of stated before. So for example, mm -hmm, I hate these Macs. Anyways, for example, if we take a look at one of the activities, this one of making mineral paints, if you take specifically look at this, this activity, you'll notice a lot of stuff on one page. We were concerned about that. So we had a static resource. We sort of talked about the three levels before, a static, a dynamic, and an interactive resource. So we put a static resource here for teachers. So in this particular one for making mineral paints, there is the, a static picture. Of course, that's from one scale one. There's all, also the uh, static instructions, which are relatively simple. We talked, discussed what a grade four student could handle. So this was actually designed that a grade four student could do this. But this is more or less designed for the teacher. It's intended for the teacher, but a student can understand it. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see there is a multimedia video. So this particular one is very suitable for about a grade four level. So we actually took a look at most of our videos and tried to make them so that they were either, this is actually a legend, a First Nations legend, a Cree legend. So we tried to make them so they're localized. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of content here. So a lot of this content was from British Columbia, Alberta. But for example, this particular example of Cree content is very pertinent to us. So it works. A lot of our content also came from Manitoba from Southern Manitoba. And then uh, some of the design, we wanted to put a little bit of that interactivity. So on each page, we tried to also add, and these are online games, a little game that kids can play, this is a word search, or for example, a crossword puzzle you saw before. There's also a jigsaw puzzle you saw, the petroglyphs. Those are all basically online resources that can be created. You don't leave the website to do this. You actually play them right in this website. So there's no need to leave the website. Now you can, teachers can find the website if they so it is clickable and you can get into the website if you need to. Uh, and further down, you'll notice on every page, I think you alluded that to that for Janelle, these are external links that will open up in new pages. They won't actually take the place in this page. Oh, I guess we could. How to make egg tempura. You got me using a Mac. Jeez. So there's an example of how you can actually make tempura paints with minerals and eggs. So it talks about how to use the egg yolk to make a tempura. So this would be very similar to what First Nations would use. Not all the content is First Nations content. Okay. Is there anything else you want to add? Or? No, I think that's... Are there any links to entry? Yes, there are. Yeah. If you... Uh, some of the resources... Well, you saw in the other documents, it links to, for example, the sharing center. It points that way. There is most of the... If there's a PDF, for example, sometimes there's PDFs that we house. If there was ever a PDF that we found on another site, for example, a federal government site, we downloaded the PDF and put it into our site. So all those PDFs are actually downloaded. We've made sure that, of course, our PDF is on there. And then uh, same with the Google. Uh, all these different videos that you see here, these are actually from YouTube, but YouTube is actually embedded within the site. So because this is a Google tool, and Google, of course, owns YouTube, it allows us to embed the videos without actually hosting them, but you don't leave our site. And we don't have to worry about copyright with any of this stuff because it's actually hosted still in YouTube. And it is possible to find the site. If a teacher wanted to find the site and download it, it is possible to do that. And the teachers that I worked with for the usability testing, they said they liked that it, they could just click on it right there and they weren't opening up a million videos, that they really felt like they had a spot to stay and that they didn't have to worry about going everywhere. The coloring page, for example, that you see up there, sorry, the J. The coloring page you see up there, it's actually hosted on our site. It's from an external site. I've actually accredited it there. But you can see that they actually, it's a printable page for teachers. So they click on it, it takes them directly within our site to that page, and then they can print it off. So anytime we can do that with a PDF, we can host it internally. We also have a few slideshows that were created, uh, original content from some of the things that we've done. And this is an example of one here in the top right, uh, Rox's Tools. These can be played directly inside of an activity page, but can also be opened uh, through Google presentations. And they'll come up like this at the moment. I'm signed in, 
So I see the editable version of this. Somebody who's not signed in through or does not have this document shared with them for editing will see a finalized version of it without the editability. So these resources are very modifiable by anyone who is a part of the Living Earth website as a moderator, not as a contributor. The contributors don't have that level of access to be able to modify documents that are sitting inside of Google Drive. They have the ability to, to upload and post new resources. The moderator has the ability to work through them. Unless in the future there it was determined that some of those resources would be modifiable by certain content creators that are out there. Could be another way of keeping it a, a, a very living, breathing resource. It's also, you can share this full screen as well. So here, of course, he's actually logged in, so it doesn't show him. But it'll actually go to full screen mode. A lot of teachers, any of those, the YouTube's as well as that, you know, presentation, it'll actually allow them to go to full screen mode and play through the videos. And some of these are very interactive, like this particular one, which we played around with, actually, as you go through, is asking you what are the tools, what are they used for. So it actually goes through and it talks about what each of them is. You can set up inside of Google presentations as well. You can set up interactive activities. You can click on you can make text clickable and linkable to animations or other content. So therefore, it becomes like the old PowerPoint Jeopardy game. Or, or you could develop a number of interactive, I like to call them interactive thingies, because they are presentations. However, they are very interactive, uh, depending on how you want to make them. And they're very easy to create by uh, anybody who knows how to put images and then hyperlink them to parts, other parts of the presentation. So we do have our own original content sitting inside of some of these activity pages. In the same way that the presentations are embedded into a page, documents could also be embedded into the page. And those documents could be Google documents as well, fully modifiable uh, by people who want, to, to want, who want to do that. Also, if there were lesson plans or other resources that were uploaded in the future as Google Docs or linked Google Docs, they can be, a file can, um, a copy can be made of them quite quickly and then a teacher could modify those documents as they see fit for themselves without modifying the content that exists within the Living Earth resource. Would somebody else like to walk us through this, uh, just the recap here? Yeah, sure, I can, sure do, I can that. do that. Thanks, Jeremy. So uh, this is the Teacher Resource Center. We created this almost as a hub where you have access to the three different components that make up the Teacher Resource Center. Again, the uh, Creative Board SK form, which Brian shared with you, the Creative SK sharing area with that I shared with you, and then the membership application. Uh, again, at the bottom, we're trying to make it uh, as friendly as possible. So again, there's that help piece for those members that might need uh, that additional um, support. Can you actually go back to that page, Jay? And uh, if you click on membership application, because I don't know if we've shown that yet. Yeah, I'll navigate for you. Thanks. Thanks. So on here again, uh, directs the user to a simple form for them to fill out, for them to become a member that the moderator would then receive. And from there, the moderator can add them to the, uh, the site, as well as the forum, which is the Google Groups. And I think it was as Bill mentioned, we, we do want to ensure uh, the, whom the users are. So we have the addition of the school or educational institution, and I believe also a account. Who needs to scroll down there? But also a um, an account, a school kind of account. Thanks. Thanks. And even from, again, it's the, you can get anywhere from anywhere. If, when you click on the Teacher Resource Center menu or just hover over top of it, we didn't in, uh, include all those different components. I'll show you a little bit later, too, what it would look like for somebody that's not a member. Because, again, we what you're seeing right now for your menu is, is somebody that would be a member. Would you like to do that now, and I can screen share you? Yeah, sure. I'll just uh, skip this. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to be in another browser where he's not logged in through his Google account, so that you'll see what the, the mere mortals who are not members of the site will see. <laughs> so, for the most part, and now is the, uh, the difference between the private and the public side of the site. So, currently, this would be the public side. Um, essentially, it looks the same. All of the science student activities are available. 
uh, the banners again, that are linkable, those videos are available. When I go to the Teacher Resource Center, I'm just going to slide over here to see. Um, you can see that there's a membership application, the support in the Teacher Resource Center. So it actually doesn't allow me access to the form or the, so I'll load it here too, or the uh, sharing area. So I can still see it, but if I were to click on something, it actually just brings me back to, uh, to log in with a Google account. And at the top here, we did make sure that it was stated, you must be signed into your Google account to be able to access the form and sharing area. Uh, that's the only piece currently that, again, is that membership area uh, that can be easily changed. And so one of the nice things with using the sites is that each page can actually be set up in that exact same way. So if there's a science activity that you only wanted members to be able to see, or uh, possibly in the future, or even just as a startup to try and get teachers sharing more content, is allow the sharing area to be public. Since a moderator has to um, view, review the files and resources that are submitted, um, any, anybody could then submit a file which the moderator would review and place into the site, which then anyone would be able to have access to. So this is really the only section that is currently a membership and essentially private. Thanks, Jeremy. So we're just gonna we're just gonna take a look at uh, Google Drive and get into where we have. Sorry, this is my another class that I have. So this is the Cradleboard project at the moment. There's a lot going on inside of this uh, Google Drive. There's all the stuff that we've been doing so far. But to simplify that, we've got the Living Earth site as its own folder. So I'll take you into there now. So this is a much simpler view of that folder. And in the, the great thing about Google Drive and Google Sites, transferring this, uh, the operation of the site to a moderator, all that we have to do is share uh, this, the, the Living Earth folder and the Living Earth uh, website with the moderator, and we just enter their Google account, and they have it. So that's nice. Teacher shared resources area. This is the area where all of those uh, resources that are being shared are coming in and being organized by the moderator. There are subfolders there, and the script that is sitting on the page is pulling from this folder and all subfolders inside of it to populate that list of all the resources that are sitting on the web page. Site content and files. This is where we have all of the various bits of content that are hosted by us on the website. You can see we got audio documents, forms, images, and, and so on, all happening inside of it. So it keeps everything broken up and organized according to the types of content that are going to be in the website. Try to make it easier for the moderator, especially to be able to manage the content that's going to be coming in a lot of this is all the stuff that's going to be on the activity pages. So we'll go back again. Resource submission. So these are these folders that happen when resources are submitted. These, these folders come up and, and th things are populated inside of them, but they're not displayed on the site as of yet. So at the moment as well, we have inside the Living Earth site, when we go to site content and files, when we go to documents, you can see that the moderator's guide to Living Earth is here. So there are documents that, that are accessible that aren't sitting inside of the website. They're sitting there accessible for the moderator to use. And they can be modified by the moderator as well. They, once, the, the, once this folder is shared, anything that is modifiable through the Google suite of tools is modifiable by the moderator. And underneath forms, we're going to see the application for access to Cradleboard SAS. So when you apply for a membership, this is what happens. This application comes up as a spreadsheet. And 
all of the information that was included inside of that form is going to be time stamped along with the full name, email, Google Gmail account, all of the information that was asked for is going to be inside of this spreadsheet. So the moderator can very easily go back to this spreadsheet and see all of the membership applications currently existing and then either approve or disapprove of, of that and respond to those things as they see fit because the email addresses on Google are, are all included through that. So Google Drive is really sitting as the back end of organizing all of the content that is embedded or useful to the moderator, embedded in the website or useful to the moderator in their duties. And the site itself, the Living Earth site, serves as a shell where all of that content uh, resides. And we, we interact with all of this content through there. There's a limitation on Google Sites as to how much data can be stored within the site itself. So we found that this was a, a nice way to be able to make a uh, resource that had a lot of data, but we didn't use up our quota on the, on the Google Sites side. We used Drive and embedded content from the Drive to be able to do that, along with YouTube videos uh, being embedded inside of the site so that we didn't have to use up our quota. Hopefully, it'll be able to grow a lot in the future. In your YouTube account, is that I was going to say, Jake, could you just go back to that uh, application for access creator? What I just saw, Sandy, you can see I just created a membership. Okay. I'll be there. Just so you can see uh, how it transfers over. So Jeremy has just applied for membership. Shall we allow? No. <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> this is the wrong Jeremy. He doesn't really have a, there's his Gmail, but yeah, could be anyone. Thanks, Jeremy. Sorry, Brian, we're getting an echo from you. <laughs> getting an echo from me, the whole time, but I uh, I just I just wanted to, to comment comment and talking a lot about a lot about the moderator, moderator. moderator. And, and I just wanted to comment that too. Oh, Bill, 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 no audio, no audio. audio. Okay, well, okay, well, you could type it, and we could we can see what you're typing here too, Brian, if you'd like. I I don't have I don't much have to much say, so I just wanted to say to support, support, support easy, easy hand on hand we have created a, a Google account calendar creator board board. SK uh, uh, at gmail.com. Gmail and so, and so uh, while we wait, we wait for that for moderator, moderator to, to be selected, selected uh, whoever uh, wants to take over this website this simply website can have that login information. information. And they are currently, uh, I think they're currently the owners, owners of all this owners stuff we've created now. So it's, so it's been designed, designed for easy, easy, easy takeover. Easy takeover. The other side yeah, is that right, third party right, John right, form is we've right, used right, that account right, to create the right, John right, form right, account. Right, uh, so, right, it's right, so it's consistent and easy for that person to use it over. Just to, 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 to reiterate <laughs> what, they <think>. what <laughs> Brian, Brian, Brian was say, say, say. And... <laughs> Sorry, Brian. <laughs> hey, <laughs> it did. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's, I know. It's, it's your it's computer your that's computer picking me up. So that's, that's, we're all on headsets. So we, the Cradle Board SASC uh, account already exists and is ready for somebody to use. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, we we don't <laughs> we have the infinite loop as well as you can see. So does anybody want to add anything into the walkthrough? If you want to go, just go to that tutorial. Yep. It was just the idea of uh, where do you uh, want to be? At the at the beginning, we talked a little bit about copyright. And so you know, at the bottom of, uh, of each of these pages is the Creative Commons licensing piece, which can be licensed in different ways for different pieces of material. In other words, I want the, the, you know, the, the Creative Commons sort of mission statement to develop, support, and steward legal technical infrastructure that maximizes digital creativity, sharing, and innovation. I think we kind of felt like that fit really well with the collaborative goals of our, of our project. Right, and so that idea, if you click on... Sorry, no, I'm fine. getting... I'm going to go to the website now so that I can click. Yeah. You want it here? The bottom one, actually? Oh, the top one. All right, so I should be on the bottom one first. Okay. And back. 
You'd like sharing, sharing information? Okay. Yeah, so there's just a little piece piece on the site itself. Um, but yeah, the demonstrate that authorship can be licensed to Creative Commons in, in different ways. And just, um, you know, gives reference to the ideas that elders, knowledge keepers, or academics, right, um, may want things not to be um, messed with, right? That they need to remain in their original state, and if that's what they require, can be licensed in that way. People can see that on the page, right? Um, having said that, in most cases, the idea is that pieces can be taken, um, modified, created for their own uses, especially recognizing that different teachers, different students around Saskatchewan have very different needs, um, very different levels, different students. Right? Let's just click on the top one. Right. So, so each piece. Um, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it was fast. Right, so, so yeah, so most we would have that you're free to share, distribute, and transmit work, you're free to adapt work, um, and then they'll have these these symbols, right? So the idea that you should attribute the work to whoever the original author is, the idea that um, you may not be selling it for cash money, um, and then, yeah, you can alter, transform, or build upon this work, or not, right, depending on, on the symbols that, that you do. I think that's an important Important sort of piece in terms of that copyright discussion, and that was a parents. Uh, Can you go to the uh, contact the section of the site as well? Because well? I don't think yep. we've really shown, shown that. So it's just your uh, kind of generic contact page, but within that again, it links to a uh, feedback and suggestion form, um, and then directly back to the uh, site moderator, as you can see at the bottom there, which is the creativeboardskgmail.com. So again, the hope was to kind of direct everything through that account, unless uh, otherwise directed. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's my bad. Oh, and sorry, Brian just uh, typed something here too about the idea of uh, hoping to get users to use the form prior to emailing, which is why it's listed on the first line there in the uh, emails later on. Um, again, the form uh, would then the moderator would be able to go and see it creates a list, and they would also receive an email from that, but without trying to kind of clog up. Uh, any email address specifically. So we've already talked a little bit about copyright. Steve spoke about the copyright uh, that's described at the bottom of the site. The intention was free for us to erase the whole one. The intention is everything is basically free to learn what you want with it, modify it in particular. It's really important for teachers. It's, that's something that's very dynamic that teachers do. I take something that Janelle and, and teachers do this all the time without even talking to each other. Take her content, modify it a little bit, pump it out again. And that's just the nature of teaching as a kid. It's not like at the university. The university are, are much stricter on copyright. In a high school setting or in an elementary school setting, teachers really share materials. The entire teachers give entire filing cabinets to the other teachers and say, you know, they go in. That happens all, all the time. They be <laughs> we start the photocopier. <laughs> right. So they, the intent here is the same thing that there'd be a lot of sharing, a lot of modifying documents. The only way it can really be stopped, I guess, is by actually putting the sign on the saying please don't modify. Well, I mean, those those symbols exist, right? And that's yeah. that's kind of the goal moving forward through that whole digital community is is that idea that it would be respected by by users. And we said before that in online, you can't you just like in paper, you can't because you can have a rule and you can mark things as such. And then whether or not people follow it or not is. Jeremy, would you like to add any additional information about the private versus public areas of the site? Uh, all I was really going to say is part of that is the uh, static sections such as the student activities, the about page and contact page are the public pieces currently, where the uh, 
user generated areas are the uh, private sections. And again, I think I did mention it, but all of this is easily changed essentially with a click of a button. So uh, again, as promotion of the site, it might be nice to get people looking at the resources that are on there prior to having become a member. And again, that can just be changed as, as needed and as the moderator feels that needs to be done. Um, the, the purpose of this too is to try and create a community within the private section, uh, possibly of Google+, Plus, uh, Google Groups, Hangouts, again the forum, the discussion area, so really trying to create that community. And the hope of, by making public list, to admit, uh, I don't know, I guess uh, uh, force accountability and identifi identifiability for each of the users. Okay. Yeah, Sam, do you do you say that? You okay? Yeah. Okay. So I think we're on to uh, our Q and A. Great. So I think I think I'm going to turn the camera on in the room so that you guys can see what we look like. And we don't want to. going to. So here. Here, everybody's high. Oh, I want the camera shot. We need a wider angle. <laughs> the baby's in the picture. So <laughs> we're going to uh, turn this a little bit. There's Janelle. <laughs> More attractive side of Billy. Yeah. That's okay. You want to sit between us, No, it's good. I can tell you what. over here. I'll bring it here. Okay. Come on, Bill. <laughs> Yay. Hello. Yay. <laughs> I feel like this is the view. <laughs> is it? Hey. <laughs> Sorry. Welcome, everybody. Yeah. Who's going to jump up? Who wants to jump up and down? Like, yeah. uh, okay. um, I'm going to just kick it off with a, a, a few comments. And I've got a, a few questions, and I'm sure you have some questions. Yes. Okay. So um, I've got three comments. One, the first is this is a, is a stellar presentation in my not so humble opinion. <laughs> uh, it was great right from the get go. The technology worked seamlessly, uh, very you know complex in some ways. Uh, the, the presentation was really, really well organized. Great pace, not too fast, not too slow. Walked us through what we needed to get through. Um, excellent division of labor, and you kept things engaging the whole time. I wasn't, I, I wasn't distracted for one second through the whole thing. So awesome job on the presentation. Seriously, one of the best I've ever seen. Um, good job, guys. <laughs> yeah, good job. You guys, and you're wearing ties and everything, you know. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, we're a little underdressed. So. <laughs> hey, Brian, are you wearing shorts? <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> so my second comment is uh, the collaborative shared teamwork that's been demonstrated by you know this very complex and layered ID product and processes is quite clear. I mean, it was the team the teams came together. You all came together again. This is like I would I would call this an epitome example of an advanced instructional design class and how you work. And you know, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, the product and the processes that were demonstrated here just in this presentation, you couldn't walk away from here with any other conclusion other than that, you know, you collaborated extremely well. Um, and so my third comment is that I have three in terms of key brilliances, it's not even really a word, but the key brilliance here for me is in terms of the overall design, this is kind of our snapshot of it and, and so on. Uh, I would say A, the ease of modification and evolution of this product. I think that's, that's a brilliant piece of design um, and, and again gives it legs for the future, etc. We can talk more about that. B, the emphasis of user created collaborative environments. Hugely powerful. I mean, this is exactly what teachers need, exactly the kind of product uh, that we want to put in front of teachers. It's meeting an actual real need. Uh, and the fact that it's user created, again, it's brilliant, right? It's not just teachers, but you're also even, this is my, my uh, C point, is the inclusion of resources by students. 
I don't think this is ever done, rarely done. I mean, you did show us, showcase a few uh, model websites where I think that, that opportunity <laughs> is there that you modeled this on. But I, I really think this is quite unique. So kudos, congratulations. Um, that's all the comment I have for now. And if you want to make any comment. She's overwhelmed. What do you want to do? <laughs> no, I, I um, I have lots of questions and it's because I'm getting out of time. There's lots of space for this to grow and, and evolve. Um, yeah, and I'm really excited about the, the, the forum as well for discussion and, and having that worked out will be such an important starting place for getting to know what we can do. So, do you want to tag team on questions? Or I've got about um, six. Oh, I should, I should tell you guys something first. Um, you've never bounced the name of the site off of me, and I love it actually. But I'm also writing a book right now called Elicitary. <laughs> <laughs> so your title will, will not stay. <laughs> Just because I think it would, uh, would be a bit confusing, especially if I stayed as the book. This is the book set. Maybe I could embed the book as a big mm -hmm. book. <laughs> but um, um, I guess that's one thing, too, is that uh, eventually we'll have a home page that will be kind of like the actual of course. So yeah. it'll, and would you see having a, a separate page for different learning focuses or having them all under side that can be kind of across? I, I think that would be up to the moderator. But I, I would definitely, I think I would not make it science activities. We even struggled with that. Oh, yeah. I think I would take the science out of there, just have activities, and mm -hmm. start listing maybe the highlighted activities. Yeah. But because of the searchable side of things, they can search through and find what they want. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just change the color of the type of yeah. Oh, oh yeah, color by topic. But yeah, if it's just activities and then those expand to the that could happen. Really also cool. you could have activity areas as separate tabs through the navigation at the top. You could have oh, additional okay. so that you would have Sorry. lists of science activities or lists of language activities or lists of so and I think that's the way that the site map was developed that sits inside of the moderator's document. Mm -hmm. that there are these areas that can be developed and more activities placed underneath uh, individual areas. Okay. So that you can still navigate from everywhere, from anywhere to everywhere, right? Okay. Yeah. At the same time. I think that's an important point that depth of the site, you gotta be really careful. As soon as you get beyond about three layers deep, yeah. you start to lose some areas. And I think we're, for the most part, we're one layer deep on the site because we can get to anywhere from anywhere. And that's an important piece for a moderator to understand and work. With. We certainly struggled with it uh, as a group of people to, to, to get to the simplicity. Sometimes it takes a lot of effort to get right. to make it simple. Right. And uh, and so for sure, I think that there is also, uh, you know, and whoever's going to moderate the site or whoever's going to grow the site in the future, there is definitely the opportunity there for a, an education to happen, uh, a, a learning process to go through. Uh, sitting down with somebody to lead them through how to look at the resource is going to be an important piece as well. I don't think it takes, I don't think the learning curve is very steep, uh, but I do believe that there has to be a starting point there when we sit down with somebody to, to work with them, whether it's through the Google Hangouts interface or through uh, sitting face-to-face uh, -face to be able to uh, pass on that knowledge of how to work with them. Can folks hear us okay? Is the mic picking up well enough? Uh, no, uh, we're, no, we're trying, trying finding it hard to hear uh, Steve uh, and Sandy, Sandy like, in, in the back in the corner there. Okay. <laughs> we'll bring the mic a little bit closer and we will uh, speak up. Speak up a little bit as well. Put it on a chair. Bill? That? Maybe put it on a chair. I'll see how far I can sneak it through. That's as far as I can go. <laughs> Uh, no, it's hardware. No, no, I mean the, the hardware is long. It's just the... How's that working out for Is that better? Do you have better volume now? Yeah, we'll just wait and see when everyone starts talking. Okay, we'll just, we'll just speak up to you. We're going to get Sandy to yell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so would you guys recommend um, something like to have a periodic meeting for using the site within Google Hangouts? 
more of a lively tractor. <laughs> Nobody's making sense. <laughs> I was just going to say Did you hear question? Her question is, would we like to have, uh, or could we have in the future, some periodical PPD sessions to be able to help uh, new moderators with the resource? I was going to say, I think the moderator would be more of a problem than the uh, user itself, because under the support page, there are some tutorials, video tutorials already built in, and try to simplify it as much as possible. Um, with the moderator, again, it depends on what they're trying to do with it. It's just at the simple level as far as um, adding members, moving the files over to the resource area. Then it, I think it should be fairly straightforward to start off with. But if it's more of the modification of the site itself, uh, building in extra activities, changing the layout, uh, even possibly just changing the heading to uh, the the new name that you've come up with there. I, I couldn't hear what you had said for it, but, but I heard you said something. <laughs> Nothing yet, but oh, okay. Even um. Even using the collaborative tools, I had. Used Google Hangouts before. <laughs> Even before using this website, I hadn't used Google Hangouts before. And uh, I have to say that Bill helped me a lot with that. And so I understand a lot better. So someone who hadn't used those tools before, it wouldn't be a big problem to learn how to use them on the fly. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. And I think kind of to Sandy's point, maybe some hangouts with the community, once more of a community is created, could help promote the site to others and have some occasional hangouts and invite some other people and use it more, hangouts as a promotional tool, I guess, to get more members to the site it might be a good idea. It's also the basis of part of that recommendation for inviting uh, elders and knowledge keepers in because through these tools we've got a added feature type idea with hangouts and the like that they could be part of the community there's something going on here oh is it clay that's stealing the show here thanks clay but i think hangouts is an added feature that wasn't necessarily part of the original scope but fell into it as we as we work through it Elder sessions on Google Hangouts, that would be fantastic. That would be, especially since you can YouTube them, yeah. cut the clips up and then use the clips you want. Because you might want to cut Clay's little horns out or something like that. <laughs> go back and forth? Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got about six questions. We don't have to go through them all, but um, um, maybe you can just. Tell us here how the process uh, evolved and became smoother. I mean, I, you know, there was a, a, can I use the birthing metaphor? You know, that sort of, you know, fear and trepidation and, and how we gonna, how is this going to work and so on. And uh, uh, I, I guess I want to know whether it was an error to divide the teams up at the front end. I kind of took the license to do that. I thought, I looked at it overall and thought maybe this would be okay, but did it retard the process? Like, did it actually delay the collaboration between folks when they were kind of separated? I think it was good because I think it was at that moment that we got together as you know, our group and the content group and at least got together and said, okay, we don't know what we're doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. At least, like, that's when we started using Google Hangouts and, and actually speaking to each other. Okay. Like, and I, I, right, think, I think I agree with them, but I think at the beginning it felt like wrong. But then once you go into the process, like the smaller teams allowed me to get to know the people who were on my team a lot better. Right. And then when we did mix, like I didn't really know Jay. And then once we started to mix, yeah. then it became, it seemed like it was a much more seamless. We started to get more integrated. Right. And it was easier then. Right. Actually, the smaller groups worked well. I think, I think that also at the beginning, it, it, was, yeah. it was necessary for the team, sorry, it was necessary for the teams to be split up because we had to contact people here in Saskatoon, and it was easier for a face-to-face -face team to do that. Right. We had to research how we were going to do it technically, and I think that the teams were a really important part of the process at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think also, though, we were challenged by the fact that a lot of these tools were new to a lot of the people working, but as we, as we grew a familiarity with the tools that we were using, that it, it became easier and easier, and I think that's where that, that the end piece, like you say, where we were very 
tentative and it was slow and it felt like we didn't have much for a time. We had a lot of stuff sitting there smoldering, but nothing had burst into flame yet, I say, right? So, but I think the, the catalyst was when we, when we started communicating more and more through Google Hangouts and we breeded that familiarity, uh, we breeded that, we grew that uh, ability to work together through that forum, through that way, and, uh, and then it just became more and more easy to, uh, to develop things together. Okay. And I think we also stopped worrying about stepping on each other a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. where we were, hey, go play, it's a sandbox full of toys, go play with everything that you can find and see what it does. Right. And I think that the idea of collaboration in that sense, I think it was adopted and embraced by the entire team in the end where, you know, we don't feel bad about going in and modifying and tweaking and moving forward. And uh, I think for me that, that even up until last night we were working on things and I think the flow of the work just got to be more and more organic as we became more and more familiar with the tools that were presented to us. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the teams were necessary so that some of us could become experts in the content area and some could research the interfaces. But like Jay said, once we got over the hurdle of the two teams working together, that was where I think it started to really get going. So, so if you were, um, if you found yourself in a, in a position uh, parallel to mine in the sense that you were a manager of instructional designers, would you, what would your advice be then? I mean, you use the term organic and that would probably send a chill up a lot of managers' spines, right? Because it's sort of like laissez-faire, you know, go ahead, go and play in the sandbox and we'll trust that you'll self-organize, right? Yeah. Which from a manager's point of view or from, say, a professor's point of view, is really about letting go of control and letting go of some of those traditional roles and trusting your employees, or in this case, students, to figure it out. So what would your advice be in terms of managing this process right from the start? You, it sounds like the divvying up of teams initially was good, but the trigger point or the point at which things were clicking was when you started to um, use the tools feel comfortable, get to know one another. So would that be a point of advice, get that happening earlier? And tell me more. I was thinking, because we're, we're all quite visual, and when you look at the product and how we work together and um, kind of how we organize ourselves with running meeting notes or comments along the document side, right. I think a couple of benchmarks, like what we do when we release responsibility with our students, would be key. Okay. You know, once you started saying, Okay, it's time to move it. By that week, we all went, okay, yeah, it is time to move it. We shouldn't, like, <laughs> let's figure out where he's trying to say, move it to. Right. Right. <laughs> so if we had a couple of benchmarks, maybe as examples, or looking back, we could probably look at our timeline and actually see some of those turning points. Right. And that would be right. that, that would be a useful retroactive analysis, yeah. right? To be able to say, how did the, that's why I put that document up to sort of say, you know, do an analysis of the actual team effort and what would some of those benchmarks be? And quite frankly, this is you know this is brand new territory. This is a completely different project. And each it's, you know advanced instructional design course is usually quite unique. So, but the benchmark idea is is a good one, and maybe some examples would be useful. If I ever do this again, I'm going to have you folks as an example to be able to say, okay, get started earlier and have be at this particular point. But I couldn't predict. At this point, you know, at a particular point, you needed to be here, other than my own panic, right? <laughs> okay, any other comments? Yeah, I, th I think just going back to the, the teams, I think having some labels or some responsibility rather than just that organic piece is helpful, and they can almost be arbitrary, right? Mm -hmm. but, it, but it gives you a sense of purpose and a sense of okay. kind of responsibility. And like I said, I think that went only when we started communicating, other than like Janelle and Bill and I's first meeting. When we went out to your school, we sort of we hadn't really touched base with the people that were um, at a distance. I think I think that helped too. That third, I, it doesn't have to be an on-site team, but that third team with members from the other two teams. Yeah. yeah because all of a sudden, when I went into their hangout, 
I knew Steve, so I didn't yeah. feel like a total outsider the first yeah. time I went in there. Right. And so I felt comfortable. And I think that's important because if the two teams are too isolated, there's no overlap. Right. And it becomes difficult to work together because yeah. you don't know the dynamics of their team. Right. right? So, or if you I, miss something, you knew you had contacts that you could go to and say, you know what, Bill, I was yeah. AWOL for a week. Like, yeah. where are mm-hmm. we? Yeah. And that, that did happen during the process. Right. So on the content team, like, and on the, when we went to course with the interface team, yeah. I actually that made it much more comfortable. Right. That you knew at least one other person. Right. Okay. So I mean I mean technically it could have gone off the rails too, right? If you think about the worst case scenario. If the teams had been uh, stayed in their kind of isolated, you know, silos, um, and then only at the very end started to talk to each other at kind of crisis point, then that would have been a disaster. Uh, but you self-organized and got that happening earlier, probably after about the first third, right, I would say. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe that maybe that works best. Um, Sorry, the, I was just going to say the work itself demanded that too. So as separate teams, it eventually got to a point where without reaching out to each other, we couldn't, we couldn't move forward. So... I think those groups naturally had to come together just to get a completed product. Right, right. Um, I, yeah, there's a bunch of questions here. Um, what advice would you give to teachers who are wanting to, as you put it, fill the gap in terms of creating um, content or guidelines for creating content themselves? Like, I mean, you've opened up you basically opened up the container and said, this is an open environment, it's collaborative, uh, it's dynamic, et cetera. But, so say you have a grade four teacher and they, they want to they want to create something. Like, uh, what would you say to them? How would they go about that? Would they have a clue how to do that? I think you start with what you know. Okay. First. Like the Earth Stewards lesson, that one I could put together myself because I felt like I had some expertise in there. So to find something that they know already and then look at what they do in their classroom and, and then start researching, I guess, or look okay. at other examples like with EdHeads and BrainTap to kind of find okay. examples that they can kind of borrow from or steal as we do as teachers. Okay. So I'm going to tie in another question that's kind of related that I would see as maybe a conduit for that kind of professional development or exchange, and that would be, you know, what is your vision for the collaborative uh, Google group element? To say facilitate, as an example, to facilitate this kind of process. So teachers who are, they want to develop stuff, and they want to start where, start where they are, how would the Google group element uh, facilitate that? Oh, oh. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that's uh, the whole purpose of the forum, by allowing uh, a moderator to even pose a question, or uh, any user kind of just throw up something. I mean, you know, I'm going to be working on this next week or next month, or this is what I'm looking at doing, or does anyone have anything for this, or have you been to want to scheme, and whatever, whatever the discussion might be. So just trying to have a, a fluid conversation. And uh, My piece with the last question there was really just getting rid of the fear. Uh, as a teacher, we're always kind of fear of the unknown, and, and the fear that our students are going to know more than us and I think by just trying to create a place where they can go in and almost play and bounce ideas off of each other uh, and with having some of the resources already up there then they can pull from that and see what they can do with it and, and allow even a group of teachers to each take an activity develop it how they see fit for their students and then go back in and share what they did to discuss uh, the differences or the similarities or why why that even occurred okay that's great so that then leads me to my third related question, um, because unless you have that um, critical mass, basically, right, of, of folks in that space and eager to use it, um, it doesn't go anywhere. So you can create the open space and, and hope for collaboration and exchange, etc. cetera. Um, so, but we don't want this to die on the shelf, right? It's a great product. It's an awesome piece of work. So how, any suggestions on how we promote this best? You know, what would actually work? What's your dream of where it goes from here? Like, think big. Like, what does this look like, and how does it get promoted? I was thinking you start when teachers have energy. So they have energy in the summer. They're looking to plan their next unit. 
we talked about with some of the content team how grade four students or grade four teachers often connect this with the harvest um, in social studies in the fall. Right. So if we know that a lot of grade four teachers around the province are going to be doing this in the fall, catch them in the summer, catch them right. when they've got that energy, maybe a little. I think one of the other things might be to catch them when they're doing their Bachelor of Education, right? Like if you're yeah. an elementary teacher training, right. and one of the things that you're doing is planning units. And so we have representation here at the university. Why not include this, like create a unit and then share it through here. And then right there, you have a bunch of users that are going to graduate and go into the school system. And then hopefully that's already part of it. That's something we talked about at the very beginning is missing yeah. in Saskatchewan. So, yeah. right. This, this kind of, the type of thing that we're doing right now as well could serve as, uh, as an example of, there's a PD session happening with a group of teachers in elementary schools in Saskatoon. Right. Why couldn't uh, a few of us newly branded, say, experts on what we've created, share what we've done with PD sessions through Google Hangouts uh, to just model what we've done and to get people interested in it. Right. That type of thing could happen with a number of school divisions, getting that message out there to those school divisions, uh, you know, that's that's something to get people interested in there, is to have uh, live sessions with lots of people in a room and, and people talking about these resources and, and getting them started. Getting a few of those people to sign up to become members and then to be talking to their colleagues and saying, yeah, have you seen this thing? We've contributed some resources. I'll give you a hand with it. And as people become more and more familiar, obviously we're looking for that critical mass that they would be able to help each other out in getting more members to enroll and getting more people to contribute. Right. But I think it's a responsibility of our team, uh, of, of your department as well, uh, all stakeholders inside of this to promote it and to get the message out there that it exists and that we do want people to become part of the process. Right. Just initially too, I think, oh. It's important to uh, have or even open up the resource section that's now private just to get people to even to use what's already on there. Um, I mean, if it's already private and I have to now sign up for something and I'm not even necessarily sure what I'm signing up for, uh, I think I'd be somewhat reluctant as a teacher to, to go ahead and do that. A side point to the conversation too on a technical point of view is that the one of our reasons for setting up the navigation of the site the way we did was that it wasn't buried in Saskatchewan curriculum. So while it's still connected, I can speak as an Alberta teacher who's worked in K to three schools. These activities also tie into the grade three rocks and minerals uh, unit. So by not limiting not making the navigation too specific, you are making the project more open to other provinces and other users because we're looking for the same content in Alberta here. And I would say make sure the division science leaders, science curriculum leaders, and First Nations uh, leaders are aware of this resource because if they're bringing it to their curriculum meetings and that kind of thing, something they could share as well. Good point. Um, of course, I'm always thinking about uh, venues for research and, and to uh, promote this kind of activity in my own circles. And I would, uh, I'll probably invite any, all of you at some point to, to uh, write this up, maybe a, of course a, a more streamlined version of the instructional design process, of product formation, etc purposes and all that, and actually present it at a conference. This is exactly the kind of things, this is exactly the kind of thing that people are looking for at conferences in terms of practical, applied, on the ground, but research driven, right? Research based. When you made decisions around the visual design of this site, that didn't come out of your heads because you liked it. You thought, this is my favorite uh, visual design. It came out of some of you the exposure to visual design in 873 mm -hmm. and all of your other readings and, and understanding and knowledge. Um, and so I think to make those links and then communicate that uh, in a research community will also be important too. And we'll talk to you about that at a later date. So there's multiple, multiple levels of promotion, I think, here. Um, and, and I'm quite keen on this, you know, launching forward and we'll showcase this thing. So, I'm hogging all the airtime here, Sandy. Yeah.
that's okay. I guess my, my one um, question I had was, you talked about the challenges of, uh, of contacting experts and things like that. Yeah. I'm wondering, did you manage to find, I mean, I've given you a few. Yeah, we actually, and then, then, on the site actually, in the, the uh, in the front site, there's a contact list. Okay. And actually any contacts, external contacts you made are on that contact list mm -hmm. with their phone numbers, with their emails for the moderator in the future. Okay. It was really tough. Uh, the, the the experts we did eye contact. I don't know what you guys. The experts I did eye contact. Most didn't have any material to use. That was useful. Like even even when we talked to Cameron up at one scale, like we could go up there and generate content, but he really didn't have. Well, he actually gave us the manners and stuff. But any usable material he had, he gave us. But then beyond that, it really wasn't designed for us. We had to take the material, pull it apart, and redesign it. So it was really. Uh, there really has to be a concerted effort, I think, later on to have, particularly an undergrad class, develop content that's FNIM. Okay. Even the uh, some of the stuff that we looked at that was First Nations content, the activities weren't actually First Nations content. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? If they did an activity around, around uh, why well, use the at that most hardness scale, yeah. there's lots of activities out there around that, or leaders, for example, or whatever, but they don't integrate well with First Nations content. And really, I don't know if experts can help you. I think I think somebody has to do interviews with elders that would really help videotape them, but that's way beyond what we can do in our time frame. That's a production in itself. I I talked to uh, Gary Sibley at FSIN, and he's the science and math consultant there. He said if we had chosen any other unit other than this one, he'd have tons of stuff for us, but this one he had nothing. <laughs> So it's kind of ah. But that that could go into future areas, right? We could have more content areas, and obviously there's people sitting out there with more resources in more areas that that could quite easily become uh, a, the larger focus of this project. Part of the problem is the focus, right? Like when you're talking about experts, like for example, Ben. So I talked to Dr. Akinet, and he really can't help us with instructional design and grade four rocks and minerals First Nations content. Like he can talk to me about Western ways of knowing and First Nations ways of knowing. That doesn't translate well into what we want to present. So that was the difficulty. And same with one scaler. They can talk about what's out there, but it doesn't translate well into actual grade four classroom activities that integrate First Nations. So well, that's doing I think the problem is that it's built for kids to go yeah. there and they yeah. have hands on activities it's and really painting easy. and doing nature walks and stuff, but that's hard to recreate. Right. Yeah. Minerals would be a great one, though. Like paints, that'd be a great one to go out there and do. But I want them in a year. <laughs> you know, for us. Right. Do you have any other questions? This could grow. It's... Yeah. No, I think that's good. That's good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I have a couple of others, but it's a technical thing that's not really important. So I thank you guys. They deserve a round of applause. I'll applause you guys. Good job, guys. Great, again, great presentation, amazing product, tons of, tons of work. I mean, they don't call 874 the Widowmaker for nothing, right? I mean, right, Clay? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, great job, and uh, we'll be in touch. And, and again, you've got about a week or so for the, the report and to kind of wrap things up. I didn't want to rush it and say everything has to be due today, you know, at the point of presentation, which is often usual. So you got a little lag time and clean some things up, talk to me about some things. Uh, and I'm going to need as much feedback as I possibly can get from you because, mm -hmm. again, there aren't exams or quizzes or papers to hand in. This is it. And so I need to kind of look into your heads and, and look into your hearts in terms of what was it like for you? What did you learn? How, how did you contribute? How do you feel about the process? What can you recommend to me in terms of facilitating it next time? What mistakes did I make, for example, or not, et cetera? All those things. So this is really quite a, uh, I don't want to use the term 360 kind of evaluation or assessment, but that's kind of what it is. I want to get as much data as possible around the whole process, because that's really useful. So again, thank you guys, great job. Enjoy the rest of your day. I love the ties. <laughs> <laughs> you know,
I wore mine today. <laughs> Clay. You are the cat in the hat, Clay. <laughs> you are indeed. Can I ask, how many of you will be, you'll be on that leave, but how many of you will be teaching grade three or four or seven where the rocks and minerals are? None of us. None of you? No. Maybe. I'm high school. Maybe you're high school. Like high school. school. High school. <laughs> yeah. I'm science. <laughs> I'm, te I'm teaching grade four, but it's the wrong province. <laughs> and I, we did do usability test with a couple of grade four teachers in my school, and they were ready to use whatever they could get their hands on. Yeah. They were the ones that were talking about the Google, um, the signing in for Google, because they weren't really sure, because they've been teaching for about 20 years, and they would not call themselves technologically literate, right. but they were excited yeah, for something else. Okay, a little side chat going on there. So I don't want to. I don't want to keep us. We've got a lunch date. Sorry, you can't have virtual lunch with us, you guys. Well, you could, but it didn't taste very good. Uh, <laughs> so, and we've got a reservation at twelve thirty. So, unless you have anything else to add, any other final comments? It's been a pleasure working with you guys. Thanks. Yeah, it's been yeah, a slice. Yeah, I think uh, my wife is going to be happy to have me back. Yeah. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> Until 802 starts, that is. <laughs> Are we all in 802? That's good. Uh, eight, who's in 802? I'm in 802. Well, you're in 802, right? Yeah. See you in 802. Yeah. <laughs> Another little bigger. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you, you guys enjoy your, uh, your, uh, yeah, enjoy your beer. Yeah, yeah. Take, take yeah. care, everybody. If you're ever here, yeah. I'll, I'll owe you one. Come see me and we'll go out. Sounds All good. Right. Okay. See you later, guys. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye.